So I've been working on, at Puppet, mostly on Puppet itself, for a really long time. Uh, I've been at Puppet since 2012, and prior to actually working here, I did some pretty large-scale config management implementations in the early days of Puppet. And so it's terrifyingly enough been about a decade that I've been involved with this project and this community. It's been really awesome. It's been, a, you know, we've done a bunch of awesome things, but uh, it has been, come on in, there, there are some seats here. Feel free to come forward. Um, uh, when I was given the opportunity to jump to a new project earlier this year, I was really excited about it. Uh, it was the first time pretty much in the last seven years that I've worked on something that was uh, completely brand new. It's a project that's focused on cloud native infrastructure management. It was a little bit scary, I'll be honest. I had a lot to learn, a lot to get up to speed. Um, I had to relearn how to indent YAML all over again because that's how you know you're cloud native. Um, and I had some trepidation about it, but I did the best I could. I learned a lot from smart folks around me. And this talk is sort of a summary of the things that I've been investigating and, and learning over the past few months. So it's called cloud native configuration management, but we should probably start off with some definitions. What does cloud native mean? This is a, a fantastic book. You can download it for free. Uh, it's by Justin Garrison and Chris Nova. Um, and I want to pull two concepts. I want to pull some concepts from this to frame up the next section. Um, these are just some characteristics that they say about cloud native infrastructure. It's platform enabled, meaning that you can interact with it programmatically. It's, we're not, we've moved past the point where you have to uh, you know, manually edit files, uh, you have to um, make, you know, run set over, over config files in order to make changes, although I do have an example of that later on, terrifyingly enough. Um, it's uh, resilient, it's agile, it's operable, meaning that uh, you can control the app from inside the app, and it's observable, meaning that um, the app is designed to emit information about its operation, it's, you don't have to go back after the fact and try to examine the byproducts or the exhaust of the, running the app like log files to figure out what's going on. You may ask yourself, doesn't this just mean good architecture? Isn't this how apps ought to be made regardless of whether or not they're cloud native? And you'd be right to a large extent. Uh, and so the question then becomes, what do we know about good architecture in 2019? I went back to this paradigm, the 12 factor app. I started out writing factor with an E because I've been doing that for so long, and then I corrected it to F-A-C-T-O-R, which is how it's actually written, and it just looked wrong to my eyes. So we're gonna, we're gonna stick with 12-factor app. Um, the concept came out of Heroku, uh, which is an early platform as a service company. Adam Wiggins published this uh, document at 12-factor.net uh, back in 2011, and it describes these factors that go into building uh, modern applications. You can see them down the, the right-hand side there. Um, there were, it was pretty prescient. This is 2011, so containers weren't really a thing. Um, people were just sort of getting into this idea of re, you know, repeatable platform-enabled applications. And there are lots of things that we take for granted today that were laid out here that weren't at all, you know, they look at this and it sort of seems obvious, but they weren't at all obvious back then. Uh, for example, like having declarative configuration. It feels like we've heard that one before. Um, have a clean contract with the, oper uh, with the operating system, which, uh, again, this, since this was before uh, containers really hit, you had to do that with uh, the application that knew more about the operating system and, um, and had, a, uh, again, a contract between how the different layers ought to interact with one another. It was built to work with, on cloud platforms. That is, you could repeatably deploy it and operate it primarily over network APIs and it enables continuous delivery. This shows up as the build, release, run uh, section on the, uh, on the graph there. And um, it was forward-looking. It predates all of the state of DevOps reports, findings that were around how continuous delivery practices enable better business outcomes. But this is uh, you know, so pretty forward-looking. It wasn't infallible, though. This is from the, uh, these are the main sort of headline bullet points from the 12factor.net uh, site. And while most of these are, again, pretty, pretty prescient, has anybody really found that using cloud apps has obviated the need for servers or systems administration? I don't think so. It has changed from what we knew before about systems administration, so it's worth examining what are those differences. I think there's 
there's a few main, main trends that are actually different from what came before. We can argue whether these are the right ones or there's more or less over beers, that's fine. But I've got the mic, so this is what we're going with. <laughs> the first one is ephemerality, uh, which means the shortness of, of a lifespan. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, moving from uh, pets to cattle. That's the center square of your puppet camp bingo card. So you can fill that one in. Uh, uh, as the life cycle of the systems grows shorter, you can't care as much about an individual system. You can't give it a name, think about it as if it was a pet. You gotta treat it like a serial number. And the increasingly short life set, lifespans that we see for containerized infrastructure, um, Justin Cormack, who wrote the uh, early unikernel stuff and now works at Docker, says that they're more like insects. Their lifespans are incredibly short. You don't even have time to worry about a host name. They just sort of arise and live for a, serve a particular purpose and then are gone. Um, I don't think that uh, we're really going down to millisecond kind of life cycle or like super short um, you know, seconds, except maybe in serverless. But the life cycle becomes tied to the application release cycle, which I think is an important change. Cardinality. Uh, this re uh, relates to a concept that my friend Charity Majors at Honeycomb talks about a lot, that these events have characteristics that you're interested in, and it, it's not about which server they came from or how fast they're coming. It's, it's like the, uh, the interesting information is something that's not easily aggregatable into a time series graph. So for example, um, your usernames are an are a example of a really uh, a point of data that has high cardinality. There's not a lot of similarity across them, whereas the server name has a rel relatively low uh, degree of cardinality. We have to think about that um, because, uh, so uh, the Twitter infrastructure, I think, is a really good example of this. Uh, Ramin and Trey Torrance over at Twitter have, uh, they're running Puppet on uh, something north of, well, I, I, I don't know that I could say the exact numbers. It's many, several hundreds of thousands of systems. And they, uh, at that size, have a constant rate of errors. There's always some systems that are in an errored condition. And the interesting thing is not how many of those systems are erroring or which systems are erroring, it's whether that there's a change in the number of systems that are erroring, whether the, the derivative is, is, is non-zero. Uh, and, and that's kind of like a different level of thinking about uh, fixing, around dealing with failure. And so they don't really uh, monitor individual logs. You can't look at individual systems. They sample and keep tabs on aggregate whether or not the, that error rate is up or down and across large numbers whether or not uh, those errors have things in common with one another. Um, so that's uh, our, our traditional infrastructure isn't really well set up to handle tracing things like uh, a user's, a single user's interaction across 15 different services that it needs to talk to to get a, a request back out. The next one is immutability. Um, you can't change the state on running systems in most cloud native infrastructures. The idea of like a classic puppet paradigm of an agent running on a system fixing configuration drift, making changes to files, restarting services, it just doesn't apply at all. The systems themselves, particularly in containerized infrastructures, are, should not be changed uh, in their running state. If you need to make a change, you change it upstream in the build pipeline, create a new image, deploy the new image, destroy the old one. And so we have to rethink a lot of that um, sort of conventional wisdom about how we manage systems as they're uh, continually running. Couldn't quite fit this into the adjective framework, so sorry, English. Um, Brian Grant, one of the early Kubernetes developers, wrote an awesome paper called Declarative Application Management in Kubernetes. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But the central point relating to this is that the configuration from these tools needs to move beyond code into a declarative data model. We should not, and this is a quote, so I'll read it, express configuration as code or some other representation that is restrictive, non-standard, or difficult to manipulate. And something of a familiar concept to public folks, that's kind of how people have moved uh, into, into operating with uh, Hira primarily, rather than um, you know, going in and writing new public code every time you need to do, change behavior. But the Kubernetes philosophy, I think, goes a little bit further that, 
in that the Kubernetes API just consumes these you know, long, complicated YAML uh, changes to the API and then tries to do, do a three-way merge and resolve what the present, previous state was, what you told it to do, and what, it, what the, what the uh, desired state ought to be. And that would be like if you had Puppet running, but instead of writing manifests, you wrote raw catalogs. It's kind of at that level of pure data representation. And just uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a different model. We don't want to have code interpolated uh, because that can produce different, different results. But the thing is, everything is still really complicated. And in some ways, things are even more complicated because, for instance, for troubleshooting, you can't just log onto a server and tail a log. Uh, Gareth Rushgove introduced me to this uh, blog post, which I highly recommend reading. Um, I'll go through it very briefly, but um, that's kind of the framing for uh, the rest of the talk. So the idea is you start off with something that just hard codes um, the, the variables directly inside of the code. You gotta get it done, get it out quickly, but other people try to use it and they find out that, oh wait, you need to parameterize those things. So you extract the configuration values and apply them in from some external source. Probably familiar with this paradigm, like maybe it's just a, you know, a set an environment va variable to manipulate what a script does. Maybe it's a higher thing that manipulates what the public code does, but those va config values are extracted. At some point, things get more complicated and you can't just give it raw parameters anymore. And in some, some situations, in it building like a rules engine. I would liken this to the way Hira has functions that you can run in line inside of, the, inside of Hira, the way the hierarchy itself has variable interpolation, those kinds of meta levels of configuration that allow you to figure out which um, business logic ought to apply to produce a particular outcome. And eventually, even that's not enough, and you might make a DSL that rides on top of the configuration, and you end up work manipulating that DSL more than you do the actual code, and it takes on a life of its own. Sooner or later, somebody else comes along and says, this is all incredibly complicated. We need to throw it away and start over, and then you're back up at 12 o'clock. So that's the main point of the blog post, and the idea as it applies to configuration management is that, um, uh, it, <laughs> The quote from the author is, uh, at a certain level of complexity, hard coding a solution may be the least evil option. We don't really have that luxury, and I think there's a, uh, some negative side effects of having too low a level of sophistication in the tooling because you end up with hacks. And I love a good hack as much as anybody, but they can lead to unpleasant surprises, such as you know, the wrong higher value, for example, being applied to a server and taking everything down in the middle of the night. That's not great. Also, <clears throat> I don't think humans are really meant to author or consume non-trivial YAML any more than they are XML. It's just not a human-friendly format. So applying to Kubernetes and its related cloud-native config systems, that uh, uh, paper from Brian Grant has a link in it to a Google spreadsheet where people sort of have self-registered the tools that they've written or are working on in order to manage the configuration of their cloud-native infrastructure. And there's a lot of them. This problem has, uh, you know, there's a lot of wheel reinvention going on. A lot of these are just somebody's one-off sort of thing, but there is a, there's a robust ecosystem of folks who felt like the previous thing that was out there was not good enough or didn't meet their needs well enough, and so they made a new thing. So how can we think about those? What's out there? What does the space look like? Can we taxonomize them in a way that uh, is helpful? and maybe provide some guidance as to which, what to use when and, and what, what we should ask out of our tools. Going back to that configuration clock as it applies to these tools, I divvied it up into four main categories. The first one is raw config. I'll skip over this just because this is clearly not what we want. This is you know, literally hand editing YAMLs and slamming them into your Kubernetes API or making uh, hand-tooled requests against the JSON, uh, or hand-tooled JSON that you send into a, a REST API, those kinds of things, not a, not, not a good stuff. Uh, there's a category of tools that are sort of config generators that take input, they combine it with a template, and then produce some static customized output, which you can then feed into your APIs. There's a series of front ends. This is sort of like where the rules engines were in the original. It's an application that you're interacting with more than 
that sort of rides above the actual uh, service that you're, in, that you're running. And at some point, the complexity catches up to you and people move into a full programming language. I'll cover a couple of noteworthy examples of each of these. This is by no means exhaustive, but I wanted to give a flavor of what's out there and provide some context. Okay, generators. One that's really interesting is called uh, Capitan. I found this to be pretty cool because it uses uh, a rewritten version of Reclass. Has anybody here used or heard of Reclass? It uh, was, uh, started off its life as a um, external node classifier for Puppet, and the author changed it over to be a dynamic inventory source for Ansible, and then this rewrite provides that same sort of hierarchical data, source of truth kind of stuff for um, uh, this templated configuration. So you write, put your, your stuff in reclass and inventory, give it some input folders that are either Jinja2 or JSON on it, which we'll talk about more in a little bit, and then it compiles those into output folders uh, for a runtime injection. And that, that's, that's a pretty good approach, I think, because that output can then be uh, committed into Git. You can use that as the thing that triggers off a GitOps workflow, and you can you sort of get a in Puppet terms, a control repo sort of separation between what's, uh, what the configuration looks like and what actually gets fed out to the systems. It's a pretty, uh, there's a few um, good blog posts on how it works at capitan.dev. Uh, similarly, uh, my friend Lee Briggs, who's awesome and whose blog posts about this uh, informed a lot of this talk and, and uh, he's just a very, very smart guy. He works at Aptio, and he made a survey of a bunch of configuration management tools, and his conclusion at the end of it was, oh shit, we're gonna have to write something, which is not the place you wanna end, particularly with, when, when there are so many other things out there. Um, create is, oh, all these things have to be named with a K, by the way. It's gotta take YAML, it's gotta be named with a K. It's just the rules. I don't make the rules, it's just the world we live in. Um, but this uses um, this language called JSON it. And JSON is interesting. It's underlined in the top window in my VS code because uh, it's, it's JSON, but it's almost a programming language uh, that provides both data storage and uh, the ability to generate output that's actual JSON or YAML from it. So in this case, um, in the, and in the top side, it's uh, underlined it in VS code because those are uh, defined as errors in the template for that cluster data structure. And then the bottom one is the actual config values that override those so that when you compile the output, if you haven't supplied uh, a cluster name or cluster type, then those would cause errors and the um, uh, generation wouldn't complete. But JSON is pretty neat. Again, there's some special syntax in there like the plus after the, um, the, data, the field name, which says we can aggregate those things together. It's pretty compact syntax and we get uh, some functions and error highlighting, those kinds of things. Uh, create maps components, which are things that you run onto clusters, which is where you run them. Hydrate, hydrate or die. Um, okay, so next up, there's a few front ends. Uh, Helm, Helm's a really interesting product. I promised that I would show some said. Uh, Helm itself has gone through this whole cycle of configuration complexity just in that same project uh, over the various major versions that it's come out with. In the very first iteration of Helm, you had decorated comments with commands that ought to be run that the rest of the configuration should be run through. So you could have inline said if you wanted to and uh, you know, sort of change, change things as they went along. That didn't last very long, so Helm v2 um, had, a, had a more templating kind of system. And then in Helm v3, they are experimenting with it. It's not, it's not out yet in full production, but the idea is that they've embedded uh, a Lua, which is a small scripting language, into the configuration for it. So things got complicated enough and people wanted to do things like loops and iteration and those kinds of stuff. And so like, hey, we, could, we can just uh, embed a second programming language in it. Helm has started off as a package management system sort of for Kubernetes, but again, it's kind of gotten a life of its own. Uh, it's got a lot of things going for it in the sense that almost all of the applications that you might want to run on a Kubernetes cluster probably have a Helm chart for them in the same way that they have like an Apple package that somebody has made uh, in, in the um, add-on repositories. Um, and so you, you don't have to spend a lot of time figuring out all of the detailed 
um, Kubernetes objects that are necessary to run a particular application. You can just deploy it with the Helm chart, but you have to inject those values in from somewhere. And I think that's still a problem. Um, they, ha they haven't really, again, they haven't gotten to Hira somehow. Like nobody's figured this out. Um, and we'll talk about more about that at the end. But um, the, um, the, the values come from a, sec a secondary standalone YAML file. And there is the idea of kind of overriding a precedence or glomming two values together. And you can supply overrides at execution time, but it feels pretty primitive. Uh, Pulumi is really interesting. It's sort of uh, the tagline for it is Terraform for programmers. It uses the Terraform provider ecosystem under the hood. Uh, can you raise your hand if you're using Terraform today? Raise your, keep your hand up if you're using Terraform plus Puppet together. Awesome. That's, that's, good, to, that's good to see. Uh, I'm a big fan of Terraform. I think it's great. We mentioned it in the keynote. We'll have a little bit of a longer demo tomorrow. Um, it has some problems, though, uh, and I'll talk about those. I have it in the, in the next section. But Pulumi is interesting because it provides lang multiple language bindings over Terraform for us. So it reuses the provider ecosystem as libraries, but allows you to write the code in uh, JavaScript or Python, TypeScript. I think they have five or six different languages go, obviously. You can, you can sort of pick your programming language of choice. And the other main difference is that it, uh, to, to raw Terraform is that it keeps the state file in the Pulumi service by default, sort of the way Terraform Cloud does. Um, the command line is really cool. It has a uh, command line interaction mode uh, for working with it that um, feels very much like a uh, you know, er, uh, early 90s BBS kind of <laughs> paradigm, uh, but it's fun to work with uh, and it's, uh, it's, yeah, it works, out, works pretty well. If there's stuff that you find restrictive or annoying about the native Terraform HCL, uh, Plumi might be an interesting option for you. And onto DSL, so I have Terraform here. I'll talk about that a bit. Um, uh, Terraform's interesting because it brings sort of this operating model of, of you know, it is a, a restrictive DSL that has a very strict um, declarative uh, properties to it. Uh, all the resources have to be, you know, manages cloud resources, and it has tons of providers. It has a ton of uh, ecosystem momentum, which is really cool to see. The thing that's interesting to me about um, what people are doing with Terraform is that a lot of times you have to work with some complexity that is, doesn't fit really well into its model. And I've seen I've seen things that I mean, you would believe it because you've probably done them yourselves, but a lot of um, People use things like uh, a null resource, which doesn't actually produce a real resource, but you can embed things like, I don't know, a 50 line database migration, a raw SQL inside of there, shell scripts, PowerShell, whatever you want, you can slam into a null resource. And Terraform will think it's okay, but you're actually doing something that's like, uh, that is against its ethos under the hood. Uh, but people have to get their work done, you know, and if the tool doesn't provide a mechanism for doing that, then uh, nat nature finds a way, as Jeff Goldblum said. Um, one interesting thing that I came across uh, as a course of working with the Tecton project, which I've been involved in as um, we've been working on Nebula, is uh, this tool or this language called Starlark. It's a minimal Python language that is only for producing configuration. So any of the things that you can do in Python that have side effects are not allowed. It only has the, the subset of the language that has things like list comprehension and iteration and those kinds of things. Uh, and it runs at the beginning of that execution and produces, and it produces configuration output, uh, but provides you with a nice, you know, a real programming language to, to interact with. And there's a proposal for the Tecton project to uh, use this as a higher order configuration language rather than just the raw YAML that it supports today. Similarly, uh, again, props to Gareth for pointing me at this. Uh, I gave, you know, I ran an early version of this talk by him and he was like, oh, I did a whole series of blog posts on it. Uh, <clears throat> this is called Q. Q is a uh, data constraint language that's developed at Google. Data constraint just means that it has the ability to both Specif provide a specification for what a data structure ought to look like or what output ought to look like and produce that specification or produce output that conforms to that specification. In the top, uh, we have an example deployment that has some properties on it. If you look on line eight, uh, that's the syntax that it has for 
I mean, I have replicas that default to one or accepts any integer. And then on line 20, we override that one with three replicas. Uh, another cool syntactical thing is that instead of having a bunch of nested maps, um, you can string them all together on one line, like you have in line nine. So you, instead of having to have that significant white space that everybody knows and loves so much, you can just you know, put, put that whole data structure together and put the, just uh, produce the value on the, on the right-hand side of it. Uh, check out Garris' posts on this if you're interested in it. I think it's, I think it's pretty promising. It's kind of neat because it has you know, a straightforward syntax. It has the ability to do um, type checking and, some, and provide some constraints, but it's not too much syntax. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. <clears throat> so what did I learn through all of this? Number one, there's no new problems. My old boss had a sign on his wall that said, rule one, there are no new problems in IT. Rule two, if you think you have a new problem, see rule one. I think about that a lot, because as I've been going through this tool ecosystem, I see a ton of wheel reinvention. And I'm not sure if it's because people don't know their history, or they know it and think it's something to be ignored, or you know, they think they're really, they're really hitting on to something new. Um, we all end up somewhere on that, config, on that clock, regardless of the problem domain we're trying to solve for. Number two, the complexity will chase you. So the world is a complicated place, and the tools that are too simple end up shoehorning in that complexity instead of managing it. So you end up with uh, YAML engineering, like overloading simple things and making them unusable. Um, so when I see things like a continuous delivery tool that says it's got purely declarative configuration, and there's 10 lines of YAML and then 30 lines of embedded PowerScript, how declarative is that really? It's not very much. Like, we have a technology, we can figure this out. Last one, that hybrid approaches kind of rule. Um, hybrid approaches are good because orchestration is a real problem, and th there are things that uh, the real world doesn't fit into tidy boxes all the time. So it's nice to be able to have something that allows you to pick and choose your toolbox and to blend approaches together to get the result you want without having to go completely around the boundaries of, of what the tool wants. We saw this in Puppet. I mean, as a, a phil you know, kind of our idea of philosophical purity uh, got stripped away as people wanted to do things that had a particular order in them. Or again, similar to the uh, Terraform example, you know, you have a bunch of really tightly constrained, defined resource types, and then an exec resource that has 20 lines of shell in the middle of it. You kind of like blown the whole thing. But you did that not because you're a bad person and you should feel bad about it, but because that's, that was the best way to get the job done and the tools should support that kind of approach. So here's a little road ahead. This is up by my house on Mount Tabor. It's like my happy place. Um, as part of the Lyra project, which we've kind of decomposed and are contributing libraries into other upstream open source cloud native projects, we built things like uh, Digo, which you, can, which you can check out here. It's a simplified version of the Puppet type system that takes a syntax that should be reasonably familiar and um, extends it to be a little bit more Go-like and a little less Puppet-like. So you can, you can do things like validate uh, YAML as it comes in rather than have to throw it up against the API and have it fail in a mysterious way. Um, this uh, is an example that when you run it against the command line tool, we'll either succeed or, or fail, depending on whether the input matches or does not match the specification. Hira is also, obviously I've talked about that a lot. Um, we built a uh, Go implementation of Hira um, that uh, is n pretty much uh, feature parity with the version that's in Puppet, with the Hira 5 that's in Puppet, but it's standalone and it's suitable for inclusion in other tools. So we're looking at maybe working with those other um, uh, config tools and making it so that you can configure, you can specify your, your data inside of Hira and uh, have it produce configuration for your, uh, for your um, Kubernetes cluster or whatever it is that you're building. Uh, and it has a lookup binary that's just this, pretty much the same as the, uh, the one that's inside of Puppet. And lastly, uh, I mentioned this a little bit before, but one of the things that we're really interested in is making Bolt and Terraform work better together. Uh, there's an integration now that runs Terraform kind of as a shell thing, and we're looking at working against the API a little more closely. But this lets you do things like run Terraform to create infrastructure, and then use that infrastructure as targets in Bolt. Uh, so you can manage it with, with later steps in your configuration. <clears throat>
to close, I just want to close off with this quote. This is also a really good paper uh, called Borg, Omega, and Kubernetes that is from the early authors of Kubernetes. And they talk about their lessons that they learned as they were building Kubernetes as the third system inside of Google to run these big distributed um, uh, cloud, cloud native applications. And the hardest ones are related to managing configurations. And uh, we could have devoted this entire article to the subject, still have more to say. We could have devote, devote an entire conference to the subject and probably still have more to say. Um, that's all I got. We're out of time, but I'm, I'm happy to hang out the, in the back uh, afterwards and uh, take questions and talk more about this. I'll be around for the next couple of days, so please grab me if any of this strikes your fancy or if you think I got something terribly wrong, I'm happy to hear that too. Thanks a lot.